Okay, so um, originally I was going to do a talk on just the general community work that Canterbury Archaeological Trust do as a whole, but we recently made a decision to postpone our field school for 2018, and I felt that you might find that a little bit more interesting. Um, so this is not a how to source funding talk, um, it's rather a case study on what we've done and why we felt we've needed to do it. Um, I'm not going to give you any answers, I'm, I'm sorry, um, but hopefully maybe inspire you to, um, to look outside of HLF for your own funding needs. Um, you are going to make your own minds up as to whether we are doing the right thing uh, by the archaeology, the community and the students who pay to come, and whether or not we're going about it the right way. Um, in the same vein, you're going to decide whether we have been successful or not. Uh, I'd like to think that we have been a little bit successful. Um, just a quick note, this building here, here, you see that with the mouse coming up on the screen? Yeah. So that, that tube, that white tube, that's a Martello Tower. Um, it's going to feature a lot in my presentation because it's in the landscape. The Napoleonic period, um, this one has a World War II um, sort of post on the top of it. Um, just in case you're wondering what that was, it's a Martello Tower. It's going to feature a lot. Okay. So to quickly introduce myself, I am Annie Partridge. I am the Community Archaeologist at Canterbury Archaeological Trust. I am also the CIFA Voluntary and Community Special Interest Group Treasurer. We have a stand outside if you want to come and say hi later. I am also the Kent Archaeological Society Fieldwork Committee Secretary. Um, if you're from Kent, that is a big deal, but I know in Glasgow it probably doesn't sound like it. Um, I was once one of the Council for British Archaeology Community Archaeologist Training Placements at Canterbury Archaeological Trust. Snappy title. Um, so if you're ever wondering what happened to those humans, well, here's one of them. Um, and I know what happened to a couple of the other ones as well, if you're interested. So to start off, I went to a conference recently, hi James, um, and it was in Hampshire, and no one put any maps of where the places they were talking about were. So here's a map with Folkestone. I did not know where Folkestone was until I moved to Kent. So there it is, the orange dot, um, just outside London. Uh, only 23 miles away from Calais. Uh, Dover is just around the corner. Uh, big World War I and World War II heritage. Folkestone is the port you left out of when you went to fight in the wars, both wars. Uh, they do a lot of celebration stuff. Um, very big monuments there to both of the wars. Um, you came back in through Dover, by the way, uh, so that the people going out couldn't see the people coming back in. On a good day from our site, you can see France bit of a problem with the mobile phone networks as they do like to switch over and France being an hour ahead you often think your lunchtime is coming up and it is really not. <laughs> also thanks to the phone networks for making calls and texts free now if you're in the EU because it was costing us a fortune a couple of years ago. Um, yeah so here is our site you can see the white cliffs of Dover Heritage Coast right there in the background this is not the section the National Trust owns that's just around the corner. You can see the chalk in front of you, directly in front of you, is what we call a band of gold clay. Behind us, in terms of the map, will be a band of green sandstone, which is a sandstone that is green, inventively named. You can see where the gold clay hits the sea, and we all know what happens when clay gets wet. It starts to turn well, a little bit sloppy. So there is a huge problem with coastal erosion in this section. You can see where all the green trees are, that is the area of rotational slip, technical term. It means that the site isn't gracefully sliding into the sea. It's being churned over and spat back out on the beach. You can go down the beach and go beach combing. Interestingly, you can pick up fossils as well. We do get a lot of people bringing fossils for us for identification. I'm not very good with my fossils. So I'm going to quickly take you on a journey of the history of the archaeology of the site so that you can get a scope of what exactly we are losing to the erosion. So we're going to start in 1919. The drains from a villa were seen eroding out of the cliff and the Folkestone Council decided to do something about it and in 1924 they opened the villa up. They went down to the walls and to the floor levels and they excavated the entire complex. It was commandeered during the war, it had a gun post sunk into it and uh, a tract Caterpillar tracked vehicle went over the top of it as well, because um, we can find the Caterpillar track sometimes. Um, obviously, fighting the Nazis was a little bit more important than keeping the Roman heritage alive. The site was covered back in the 1950s after the post-war austerity. And here is a lovely handy plan of what exactly the Roman villa looks like. Well, did look like. Um, 
I'd like you to just pay attention to this little bit down here, this lovely curved bathhouse section, because that's what it looked like in 1989. Um, the Kent Archaeological Rescue Unit excavated it with the purpose of assessing what condition the building was in and how much had gone over the cliff. You can see the cliff just there. That's the cliff. It was covered back over again and then in 2010 was re-excavated as part of the HLF funded project a town on earth Folkestone before 1500. Um, it was a £300,000 project of which uh, £50,000 was diverted to support the archaeology of the Roman villa. This is the north wing, or part of the north wing, and also an ex they excavate part of the courtyard. Um, they took the, floor, they took the um, layers down to the floor surface and they actually went underneath the villa, which they didn't do in the 1924 excavation to see if there was anything underneath it, and there was. Um, so if you just make a quick mental note of that cliff edge there, because we're going back to the 1924 plan, and the cliff edge is somewhere down here, about 100 yards away. We think, using our GPS wonderful technology and this plan, we think that the cliff edge now runs something along here. So the bathhouse is gone, and it's coming up here, and it's clipping the edge of the north edge of the villa. So, that's since 1924. So it's a bit concerning that we are losing the villa over the cliff. What is more concerning is what will, what's underneath the villa that's also going under the cliff. So, ring gullies. I don't know how brilliant this picture is going to turn out on these slides, so I've got you a lovely plan. So, ring ditches underneath a Roman villa, not uncommon, does happen. But what was really, really interesting about these ring ditches is they were producing loads of these things. <coughs> So we've got hundreds, hundreds of these. People in the local community go down to the beach and they pick these up off the beach and they make garden walls out of them. There are thousands in the local area. We've got hundreds as part of our collection. They are quernstones, made from the green sandstone, which I mentioned earlier. They're made in the late Iron Age. And um, I'm gonna use the term factory. It's a late Iron Age quernstone factory. Uh, we've been told by Chris Green, our quernstone expert, that um, it's, it's pretty unique to the UK. He doesn't know of any other site that has this. So, in 2015, it was decided, I wasn't here by the way in 2015, I, didn't, I wasn't working for CAT, I came in um, in 2016. So they decided to set up a field school to investigate the Iron Age settlement underneath the villa. This is approximately where the villa site in 2010 was. It does actually extend further out up here. So you walk over it when you go to the toilet, which is here. Um, this is a massive dog walking park, by the way. So if you like dogs, this is definitely a field school for you. Um, so in 2015, it was decided just from our commercial point of view that there was a gap in the market for good quality field work training for graduates. Um, the age old debate about the quality of field work training that's coming out of universities. Um, so we decided, or well, they decided to use, uh, to set up a field school where CAT staff would train um, anyone who's interested in learning about fieldwork techniques, um, using the badge of passports and certificates of participation as evidence. Um, the training can be individually tailored, so if you want to just come and do some planning, we've got loads of planning that you can do. Um, if you want to just do digging, you can just do digging, you know, it, it's completely flexible. We, we offer day experiences as well as week-long placements. Um, so this and support from the local communities and grant funding would hopefully allow the excavation to continue to rescue this site. We've run for three seasons. As I said, we've taken a pause for next year. The field school has been successful. Um, participants have gone on to do uh, archaeology at university. They've gone on to get careers. Uh, they've gone into uh, other stuff. Uh, or they decided that it wasn't for them, which I think is equally as important when you're trying to decide what you want to do with your life when you're 16. <coughs> However, the field school fees aren't covering the excavation costs. So I'm going to quickly take you through how we have made up the shortfall. So far, funding has come from the Association for Roman Archaeology. Um, they did some, they funded us a little bit in um, year one. So they've obviously got an interest in Roman archaeology. The Up on the Downs Landscape Partnership Scheme, they helped us in years one and two. They couldn't help us in year three because their project itself was winding down and they ran out of grant funding. Um, they were particularly helpful for funding bursaries for 16 to 24 year olds. Um, and providing some equipment for us. We've had huge support from the Roger Dehan Charitable Trust. Roger Dehan is the gentleman who is Saga Tours. Anyone heard of Saga Tours? Tours for the over 50s. 
Um, he's from Folkestone and he puts a hell of a lot of money back into Folkestone. He's really turned that town around. He is very, very interested in um, funding placements again for 16 to 24 year olds and has, was a huge supporter in years one and two. Um, we kind of had a bit of a miscommunication in year three, so he didn't support so much in year three, but we're hoping to re establish that partnership again. Um, so we had a lot of years one and two, we had a lot of GCSE and sixth formers. So, um, that was quite nice. Uh, they were able to come and train with us. Um, the Kent Archaeological Society, of which I am the secretary of their fieldwork committee, um, they've been going since uh, 1867. They've given continued support for all the three years, and this year they sort of they funded a supporter cabin, and we were, had a little museum up there of the finds that we had so far. So they've been good to us. Obviously, Canterbury Archaeological Trust, uh, not just providing staff to train and design the program, but they're also providing us a lot of tools and equipment. We've also got our two local groups, Frankston Research and Archaeological Group and Dover Archaeological Group. Um, they don't really give us money, but they do payment in kind. So uh, FRAG do a lot of our fines washing and um, DAG are, um, <laughs> they're very, I know, they, they're very good. Uh, they're very experienced archaeologists, so they come and give us support um, on site with the training. Um, so I don't know if you noticed, but as I said, the funding dried up in year three. So uh, that was last year. So, challenges with the future. This is where it gets exciting. So, we have no substantial backing from the universities. We have two universities in Canterbury, and neither of them are... Um, it's not that they're not interested, but there are a lot of um, blocks to them getting involved. Um, they have their own projects. Um, they can't afford the prices that we're charging. Even if we give them discounts, they're still not... They want further discounts. It's not even covering our staff time. Um, there are, there are universities actually shut over the summer because of conferences. They turn into conference centres, right? I'm sure most universities do it. So the students don't even have anywhere to live. So, um, and that in itself poses a huge problem for us because then we have to organise uh, finding somewhere for them to stay, which pushes the price up, um, which they can't afford to pay for in the first place. Um, we have no money to fund any serious marketing. Marketing is done by me. Um, I'm a trained field archaeologist. I'm not a marketing strategist. Um, I mean, I do my best through the usual channels, Badger, Past Horizon, CBA, Current Archaeology, social media, we have a website, but I, I don't know where to go with it next. I'm, I'm not that human. Um, the site is run as a community excavation along the side of the field school. Now, this is, this is where it's going to get a little bit interesting, and I'm going to have to pick my words very carefully. It's perhaps not a big issue on the face of it, but offering free training when you're asking people to pay to be trained, I don't think is acceptable. Um, the archaeology is complex, but it's all in one area. So we have limited space in terms of the amount of people that you can put on the site. So obviously I have to give priority to the people who've paid to come. And that sometimes leads into a bit of conflict with uh, people who've given their time up very generously to come to dig with us, because I think... Um, it's just a bit of a nightmare, to be honest. Um, and there's also sometimes conflict between volunteers and students, which can spill into social media, which um, has led to some... I can see faces and nodding. Like, it's led to some pretty interesting discussions, pretty... Uh, have to apologise to people on behalf of other people. It's just... I don't want to say it's a nightmare, because I'm the sort of person who doesn't like to say no to people. Of course I want people to come on my site and get involved and excavate, but... I also need to get paid. I need someone to fund it because I can't give my time up for free. Well, I can't give all my time up for free. Um, unfortunately, I have to eat. Um, Entry-level archaeological training has changed since 2015. There are an increased number of training placements being offered by commercial units. So why are you going to pay to come on a field school when you can be paid to be trained? Um, especially with the high-speed two um, train line coming up lots of companies offering training placements, which is fantastic. I mean, I never had that opportunity when I started in archaeology, but it's having a detrimental effect on our field score. We had a couple of people pull out of the full four month of the full month programme because they got jobs. I was like, oh that's really great for you. <laughs> I'm really happy for you. <laughs> So we, we possibly have to have a rethink of what we're offering and how we're offering it as well. Um, there is an expectation that CAT will make up the shortfall of the project, which is, is okay, it has been okay if it's a couple of thousand, but we're talking um, a little bit more than that now. And we are a charitable trust with an educational remit, 
But in funding a lot of money into the field school, it's taking money away from our other charitable obligations and the other um, commitments we have to education uh, that the, the charity does. So um, I, I don't know how I feel personally about that. I don't want to take money away from other things that we do to, to fund the field school. But if we don't excavate it, the site goes over the cliff. And as I've said, I don't know if I use the words internationally important. I'm going to repeat that again, internationally important. <laughs> but it, ugh, what do you do? So moving forward, we're pausing the project for 2018. I've already mentioned that. We need to decide whether it's a field school with paid for training or a community project with free training and make the clear distinction between the two. Um, perhaps run it as both, as someone suggested, do a month of field school and then either side of it have a community excavation. I don't know how that works for applying for further grant funding, but it, it's, it's an option we could explore. We need to look for grant funding to support the project in a bigger way. Uh, this includes post-excavation and publication. Um, there are people lined up, grants that we can access for the publication, uh, so don't worry about that, that's kind of already covered. Uh, but. Yes, it's, it's a big, yeah, it's a big concern. Obviously, you're looking for further grant applications. Um, I think the lovely ladies alluded to it earlier, that that costs money. It costs money to sit there and type these grant applications, and who's going to pay for that? CAT have been very generous, and I think they will continue to be very generous, but oof. what's the answer? Perhaps there isn't one. So we need to look for potential partnerships, perhaps try a little bit harder with the universities we've got, or look abroad. We've got a really great relationship with the uh, University of Texas, so perhaps explore that a little bit more. And we're very close, as I've already said, to France. So maybe look into looking at the French, the Belgian, the German universities, perhaps tap into the uh, market abroad. Um, it could be done, we're only 30 minutes. In fact, folks that is the terminal, I don't know if any of you have been on it, for Eurostar. So they could quickly pop over on the car. So not an issue. So we need to revise the scheme we deliver and look to improve it, possibly looking at accreditation, um, either by universities or by um, the IFA. So here's, I've been quite negative, so here's a collection of pictures of people looking like they're enjoying themselves in the sunshine on my dig this year, um, in all weathers. Um, so I'm just going to finish now with giving you some top tips. So my top tips for uh, community projects is to not chase grants with outcomes not suited to your project. So uh, we have a bit of a we have a lot of refugees in the Dover area, a lot of refugee children, and um, someone was going to offer us a, a small amount of money if we could get them involved. And I, I think that's a very good thing to do, but I don't want to tack that onto this. I would rather do a separate project where I can do them a proper service and design a proper program to get them involved, as opposed to just sort of an afterthought just to get 500 quid. Yeah, and then we'll have them on site. Because I think when you're talking about children, especially with Syrian refugees, who've been through a lot of trauma, they don't even speak English as a first language, I think it would do them a disservice by sort of tacking them onto the end. So I think that's, that's one of my top tips. Like just have, just think about the people that you're, you're sort of included in your group. You know, are you tacking them on to the end or are you actually doing something good with them? Uh, keep it simple. Oh my God, keep it simple. Uh, be mindful about who's you've got coming on different days. So perhaps maybe not having the, the app group of 20 kids on the same day that you might have a, a group of people with anxiety issues or post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> you know, let's... No. I mean, not that I did that, I didn't do that, but just you have to think about it. Like, think about who you've got coming on your, your days, and this is a big one, is you're, you are allowed to say no to your project manager when he comes up with these really fantastic ideas about, oh, let's just open it up and have these groups on the same day. No, let's, let's, let's not do that. Let's take a step back and actually think about it. And you're also allowed to say no to them, to the project managers, when, they don't, when, they're, when they're office-based. So they come up with these great ideas, but you no, know, you don't know the site dynamics. You know, you're not. You don't know what's happening right now. You don't know who these volunteers are. You don't know who these field school participants are. Let's let's not. You know, I, I just say no. Um, and you're allowed to say no to groups if your site isn't suited to them. So uh, I don't know if you could get this from the pictures, but our site is on clay and it bakes quite solid in the sun like very solid. So we do have yak groups that do come up. There's a, a collection of yaks there, Bexley Heath yaks with us. 
but they find it incredibly difficult to travel. They find it incredibly difficult to engage because the site is solid. <coughs> Adults find it hard. I mean, it's tough. So, you know, perhaps either saying, I'm sorry, but the site isn't suitable, or coming up with an alternative activity that they can do besides digging, although that's what they want to do because the site is so solid. Um, and, it, I mean, you've seen through my talk that we've approached local charities that perhaps aren't heritage or um, in that sector. Um, so perhaps look wider into what you can access to. I mean, we're very lucky with Roger DeHaan, but I'm sure there must be other local charities, local groups that can do that. And don't just look for money as well. Look for payment in kind. Um, a lot of shops and local small businesses might um, donate tools or they might donate, I don't know, fencing. They might donate something that isn't necessarily money but could help you keep costs down and keep, keep it going. Um, so I'm going to stop talking now. Um, I don't know how long I've got or whether I've overrun. Oh, no, I think I'm on time. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>